joined by Roger Junior Sorolla. Uh, so Roger, he, he completed his undergrad degree, undergraduate degree at Cornell University. Um, and he had a PhD in psycho social psychology at NYU in 96. Uh, he's now based at the University of Kent um, uh, and he was promoted to professor in 2013. He's the editor in chief of the Journal of Experimental uh, Social Psychology since 2016. And Roger is really an important uh, and sort of tireless uh, um, advocate of uh, transparency in scientific reporting. And he's written uh, many articles of how to improve the standards and guidelines and try to uh, sort of raise the the floor of uh, the um, of, of psychology and social psychology broadly. Uh, so we're really happy to have him today. Uh, I'm particularly excited for his talk because uh, one of the sort of unspoken issues with um, the open science, open research movement, is um, the fact that we are in in uncharted waters, and there are a lot of uh, moral and ethical questions that are being raised uh, frequently and urgently and hopefully uh, Roger will help us navigate those waters and uh, and sort of talk us through some of the key issues that we should take home and, and really think about. Um, so what I will do now is I will hand it over to Roger. So um, one of the AB teams, shall I um, get Roger's content? Um, Okay, I've tried to share my slides. Yeah, I I think okay, you're yeah. it says they're showing. So yeah. okay, we are good. Shall I shall I take it away, Sam? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Roger. All right, thanks for the introduction. That's a very a very nice introduction. And I'm really happy to be in the somewhat weird format for me. This is the first external talk I have given by uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, or indeed any of these uh, measures. So, uh, but uh, this is a talk, uh, probably one of my favorite topics uh, to talk about. And I think these are, big, and I think what you're getting right now are a lot of my thoughts that have not yet been put into article format. They, they might, become an article well, if and when I get time to <laughs> write an article after all the other things I have to take care of. Um, but it really gets to the point of a lot of the controversies that pop up that have popped up in the past now going on almost 10 years in psychology of um, dealing with a reform movement, dealing with a uh, reform movement that has popped up after the year 2011, which brought to the fore what I like to call two very salient failure cases uh, of our uh, publishing and reporting system, uh, namely the Stoppel fraud case, but also the uh, Daryl Bem ESP uh, experiment that was published in the top social and personality psychology journal, JPSP, um, that appeared to show ESP, but actually was a textbook example of how you can make nothing appear to be something uh, given enough questionable research practices. So after and during and after this terrible year of 2011, um, there has been a lot of discourse uh, about what we should be doing. And when, when the word should comes into it, then almost inevitably it goes into uh, a moral question because uh, because of a number of mechanisms I'll talk about today. And I, I should mention that my actual research, I, I do meta science, of course, but my my actual research, um, my primary research is about moral emotions, fun things like anger, disgust, shame, guilt. I've got a student now working on creepiness, another one working on resentment. So I'm, I'm very aware of the sort of negative side, the tendency of people to morally condemn, and I can't help but see this reflected as in a mirror when I look at the discourse around open science over the past 10 years or so, that uh, you also see a lot of condemnation, a lot of heat uh, to go along with the light, and not all of the heat is actually productive. Some of the heat is smoke, in fact, and it obscures uh, and inhibits uh, the improvement of science rather than um, rather than uh, helping it along. So the title of my talk uh, is going to look at 
two examples of, of moral overreach, two examples where I argue that a moral or a moralized point of view on reform is not warranted and it has uh, deleterious effects. But then I'll also focus on another uh, third example, which is an example of ethical failure. It's where an example where I think that people have not been attentive enough to basic level ethical and moral principles. Uh, and even to this day, many journals, many organizations lag behind in acknowledging this ethical failure. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about in a bit, but I, I want to emphasize that in, in, in my research and in uh, in moral psychology research uh, as a whole, we have morality as a term, which obviously is seen very positively. It's good to be moral. It's good for a, an organization or an enterprise to be moral. But we also have moralization. And moralization is kind of the dark side of morality. It's the, you can, you can imagine uh, sort of witch hunters going on a frenzy because they perceive evil out there and actually creating evil in the hunt against evil and treating people cruelly uh, because they're convinced that they are on the moral, uh, morally correct side. And so seeing an issue as moral doesn't necessarily make you moral. And that's that's a that's a truth that has come through in this topic. Okay, let me let me move on to defining things a little more. Let me just see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So uh, yeah, just to just to follow this up, moralization. Um, is uh, when I use this term, I mean it's a it's an it's either a novel or in some cases an inappropriate applications of features of moral thought to an issue that can also be viewed pragmatically. I'm not going to say that all moralization is wrong, um, but um, it can happen, for example, that suddenly a society realizes these people who are chain smoking in a restaurant actually are causing harm to the lungs of people who may be in the restaurant and and not wishing to smoke. And so this has become not only a pragmatic public health issue, but now it's it's moralized. If you start smoking around someone when it's not allowed, you'll not only that's not only illegal, but it's also seen as immoral. You're acting without concern for other people. Of course, in the coronavirus uh, epidemic, we've we've seen a very rapid adoption of moral standards around people's beliefs of you know, should you be that close to this other person? Should be walk? Should you be walking around? Uh, you know, just to get a takeaway. Should be wearing a mask. Um, you know, so we're seeing moralization live, and um, it's being viewed more as just a pragmatical issue. But actually, you ha it's part of your perfect duty to respect human life, and and human life is one of these things that when you bring it up as a value. Um, you bring it up in order to argue that there, this is something you shouldn't trade against. Um, not everyone believes this, but you know, until recently, uh, you would have thought that this was the consensual uh, morality in Western society. So we talk about Alan Fisk and Phil Tetlock's work on taboo trade-offs, the idea that a human worth life cannot be fungible for any amount of money, which of course people in medical ethics can't really go on that principle, but a lot of individual, a lot of people believe that and they're unwilling to say, oh, if, if we could make a million dollars by killing someone and selling their organs, we should do that in order to help other people. There's a limit to utilitarianism. Rosin, as I've said, has Paul Rosin did research on how health issues tend to be moralized as, as, as knowledge increases about how practices harm other people. And some of the key elements of moral conviction, I, I will say it's a two-edged sword, uh, that sometimes is great to have a moral conviction, but it also can cut the other way. And some aspects of a moral conviction are that the ends allow no balancing with means. You cannot take a utilitarian approach to a moralized issue. Um, that uh, that authority, it's, it's independent of authorities and of how peers believe. If you think that you have the moral conviction, it doesn't matter if you're in the great minority. It doesn't matter if you are going out there and protesting like they are in the United States, even though you know 80% of people think it's a good idea to stay inside and observe the lockdown. Um, your morality urges you to go out there and, and 
protest and, and speak your mind no matter what. And in extreme cases, moral conviction can lead to intolerance and even to violence. If you think a, a person or a group of people are inherently immoral, then you're going to do what it takes to promote morality and to shut them down and to restrict them, or even in extreme cases of genocide, to destroy them. And one of, one of the fun things to lecture on here, uh, it's not fun, obviously, when you think that this can lead to things such as genocide, but it's it's this it, it it resonates with this compelling motivation that's interesting to observe which is demonization this concept of demonization this this can be derived you can see the cartoon here um you know people are trying to summon demons <laughs> they like to use demonization in terms of absolute good and evil in their rhetoric uh, and summon up these demons because it lends a lot of fire and fury and, and, and credibility to what they're trying to say. And we and Kurt Gray and Dan Wegner way back in 2009 first observed that we are very prone to typecast people into moral roles. That whenever a situation uh, arises, we find it hard, and this may be a cultural thing in the West, but we, we find it hard just to see these are these groups of people with their different interests, and this is the this is a way to achieve this result. Instead, we tend to put cast people as heroes, villains, victims, and so on. And this leads to a process known as demonization. I, along with Bernie Leiter, Leidner and Manu Castano, wrote a chapter about this. Um, I think some research has been done on this concept in the in the in the meantime, where when you cast an an outside an out group as demons, you believe you become more punitive, you polarize that other group, and then there's this idea of dose insensitivity, which is which is I think a function of using disgust metaphors to talk about good and evil and and and, and demonization, the idea that. Um, Disgust is dose insensitive because it evolved to protect us from uh, parasites and, and germs and viruses and other things that can multiply. So even if you take, if you, if I asked you, uh, just ingest uh, this eyedropper, this drop in an eyedropper that contains exactly one coronavirus, you'd probably be very, very reluctant to do that. Where, if, whereas if I said just inject, just just to just you know ingest this eyedropper that has one molecule of arsenic. You might be more inclined to do that, it, just because just because somehow you know that the virus is disgusting and you shouldn't have just a little, even just a little drop of disgusting things uh, in in what you're putting inside yourself. So um, you know that that'll this will all become relevant as we move on to the examples in discourse on open science because has there been moralization and demon, demonization in these debates and of course the answer is yes obviously a lot of it goes on in Twitter um, you know thank you Stuart Ritchie for introducing me to Twitter back in 2017 it's been such an education uh, this talk would be much the poorer if I hadn't had the chance to observe the way people act but of course I've seen it on Facebook and other fora even at conferences uh, live face to face. Imagine that. Remember that? Yeah, of course you do. So what I'm going to what I'm going to emphasize here is the first two examples I'm going to give. One in which practices are moralized, I think, to the detriment of flexible uh, ethics and and morality. That is, you say this practice here is either a shining saint or a vile demon. Um, and because I, if you haven't guessed, I tend to lean towards the negative side in my own research so i'm going to i'm going to show you something that has become demonized in the discourse around uh, the, ro the robustness of our findings um the second example i'm going to give is an example of how reform related social identities are also moralized again this this typecasting this taking on of roles the heroes the villains the victims and uh maybe some of you who follow twitter follow this discourse or uh understand now what i'm talking about uh, but I'm going to argue also that focusing your moral attention on these levels of practices and identities, that's inflexive and counterproductive, leading me to raise the question, well, you know, if morality is something that everyone wants to be on the right side of, then what should we treat as a moral issue? Okay, so moving on. 
The first uh, example I'm going to give is an example of how practices are moralized are the demonization of p-values. Again, this is a very entertaining thing to talk about. And here you see I've, I've, I've found this graphic of an evil letter P, this wizard once again trying to summon demons, getting these kind of swirly uh, skeletons. Let's just see, and this happened, this happened a while ago, um, you could probably try this now. You can just go to your favorite search engine, type in the exact phrase, p-values are evil, and see what comes up. And you'll find a lot of people, independently, apparently, who, are, who have derived this sentence, p-values are evil. And they're not, they're not really questioning it, it seems, from these little excerpts. Uh, why p-values are evil, p-values are evil, they are evil. Why p-values are evil, um and and so on so um you know and and if you delve into this question of statistical inference in psychology and other fields and you ask some bayesian uh, practitioners you ask some null hypothesis practitioners maybe fans of confidence intervals all have this all have this moralization and a lot of it seems to focus on p-values. Now, I will agree that p-values have been misinterpreted, misused. Just to say something is p less than 0.05 does not mean that it is true. Um, you know, and I teach this when I teach statistics, and I will repeat this to anyone who will, who will listen. But also as a journal editor, I've come to the conclusion that p-values still can be a part of scientific communication if they are interpreted properly. If you, first of all, um, if you give the exact p-value instead of just, hey, p less than 0.05, if you, um, if you don't filter your results by the p-value, you don't hold to these absurd uh, standards that say that p.06 cannot be published in my journal because that's not a true finding, whatever that is. And then if you also report alongside p-value important information such as the effect size, the power, the uh, the uh, design, and the n of your study, then I think p-values can uh, help you to come to a conclusion in uh, in that in that situation. But the argument for those who uh, who argue that p-values as a practice are immoral and evil is to go from the fact that they're misused and misinterpreted, which is undeniably true, to the idea that they are wholly tainted and need to be purged and excised from the field of research as a whole. This is contamination logic. Again, the one drop logic um, that, uh, that, is, that is a mark of this kind of demonization. And then there is sometimes the segue, having shown the devil, you now show the angel and you say, well, only my special statistics can save you. And so there's an absolutism. They reject my kind of approach where I just say, well, yeah, p-values can be reported. They need to be reported with these caveats and circumscriptions. And then, you know, my, my position is actually not so far from the 2016 uh, American psychologist position paper on p-values. Um, you know, but uh, I think I think since then there's been another special issue in the sorry the American uh, statistician uh, statement on p-values. But since then there's been another uh, another issue where they've taken a more radical stance. But this absolutism you can see it um, in uh, you know people people who push confidence intervals and say p-values are bad, but confidence intervals are great, and we should use these. And my perspective is that CI's confidence intervals just give you the same information that you would get from a p-value and an effect size and reporting that p-value exactly. In fact, they're math, you know, they're, they're mathematically based on the same information that, that gives you p-values. Uh, Bayesian uh, advocates also tend to take a very uh, apocalyptic stance uh, and 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 sing the praises of of Bayesian statistics. And this leads in extreme cases to some uh, journal editors or researchers abjuring, completely abjuring all inferential statistics, as in, uh, you know, Dave Trafmo and, and Meyer, editors of uh, Basic and Applied Social Psychology, who about five years ago just declared that our journal will no longer be reporting any kind of inferential statistics, no p-values, no confidence intervals, because those are tainted with p-value stuff. 
And even Bayesian statistics is kind of suspicious. Just put the means and the standard deviations out there, the effect sizes, and just let them speak uh, to themselves. Now, from my point of view, this is deeply anti-pragmatic because actually inferential statistics tell us something that um, means and standard deviations do not. Inferential statistics are based on, among other things, the size of your sample. So they're a way to integrate the, the kind of confidence that you get from seeing that there's a large sample that was used with the actual mathematical outputs, the parametric outputs of, of, of means and standard deviations. And if you decouple those things, then people are very much on this, you know, kind of at their own mercy to interpret uh, what's going on in the research. And so uh, I'll just, uh, one year after this 2015 uh, occurrence at Basic and Applied, Daniel Lockins, um, wrote a blog post, uh, and Lockins is kind of on my side as a as a uh, on many issues actually, but uh, uh, as a as someone who argues that p value should be used just more intelligently, and so he's he wrote this blog post on the p value ban, um, and he says you know it, rhyme, it reminds me of alcohol alcoholics who go into detox and have to hand in their perfume before they're tempted to drink it. Um, so he's, he's pointing out the moralizing tone of this ban, and I think later on in the post he gets into describing the upshot. I don't know if you all on whatever device you're looking at can see this tiny text, um, but uh, in many of the articles published in BASP Now, researchers make statements about differences between groups, um, and whether or not these provide support for their hypotheses becomes a moving target without the need to report p-values. Some authors interpret a D of 0.36 as support for an effect, while in the same study, a D of less than 0.29 is not interpreted as an effect. Um, and so what he's arguing is that, um, you know, by purging your statistics of these evil procedures, you're actually hampering your ability to interpret data. Okay, and you can also make this argument for things that are that are glorified, uh, that are put on the side of the angels, like just the mere fact of having a pre-registration, the mere fact of uh, replicating a study doesn't always mean that you're going to be doing science right by doing so. There are ways to do pre-registrations that are insensitive or just wrong. There are ways to do replications that get you further away rather than closer uh, to the truth. So the, the, the virtue, I think, doesn't inhere in the tool that you're using or the practice that you're practicing, but it inheres in what that actually does for you. So Moving on to these, yeah, I, I can't give examples of all of these, but I've seen moralization of such things as replication, as pre-registration, um, you know, confirmatory versus exploratory research. For those of you who have been in the UK uh, and in the, in the psychology scene in the UK for a long time, you may know about this very long-standing and highly moralized argument of the qualitative as opposed to the quantitative uh, analysts. And uh, and that there was you know real some real dust ups and Donny Brooks about you know whether it's even moral to do quantitative methods or not, open data, which statistical software you use, uh, <laughs> SPSS versus R. Some some sometimes software is treated not just as a bad idea but as actually immoral, um, and and so on like little rules of thumb that you use. You ran a study with only twenty people per cell. That's immoral. Well, not necessarily if you're trying to, if you know that you are trying to detect a substantial effect and you have a methodology, say a repeated method, measures methodology that lets you really get some precision on the estimate. So the pitfall of moralization is that you become intolerant uh, of the pragmatic reasons to use or not use any given tool in your toolkit at any time. I'm looking right across the room at my uh, my toolbox, at my ha you know, home improvement toolbox over there, and it would it would be as to say hammers are wrong, but screwdrivers are good. So I'm always going to use my screwdriver and never ever use my hammer. Um, you know, this is the this is the kind of witch finding mentality that we have here. Okay, let's move on to uh, to the moralization of group identities. Um, and again, this is something that came up fairly early on in the whole reform movement where people uh, kind of picked sides and, 
even later on uh, organizations, if you can see my, I have my SIPs badge here. Uh, I don't know why I'm not wearing it to identify myself as a SIPs devotee. Uh, this is the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science, an organization that was founded. And I think while this organization does a lot of good work, there's also, it's also become a shorthand. And I've actually heard people referred to as those SIPs people. And I said, well, I'm a member of SIPS. And like, oh no, you're you're one of the good ones. You're, you're not one of the bad ones. Uh, so you see these group dynamics that I've, I have much of an eye on from my point of view of studying prejudice uh, and things like that also have popped up in, uh, in the conflict between reformers and people who uh, for whatever reason uh, don't think reform is a good idea right now uh, or ever. So, um, this has been going on, I found, it's always a very good idea to look at old articles because often you'll find that what is what is apparently new is actually old, right? And um, you see in this article from 1992 by James R. Weibel um, that economic analysis leads to two categories of misconduct, replication, failure, and fraud. So even here, they're jumping into the conclusion that if I fail to replicate somebody's um, somebody's experiment, then this means that they're ex they were um, at least doing research misconduct, if not out and out fraud. And this is a common mistake that people make. Of course, if a if a if a result is fraudulent or fabricated or even just built on questionable research practices, it's not going to replicate. But that doesn't mean that everything that doesn't replicate is misconduct. These might be legitimately context dependent effects, especially in areas like social psychology, or you might have screwed up doing your replication. But it was very, very quickly in this debate, uh, things polarized. And if you were on Facebook looking at or Twitter looking at this, you saw this happen. Um, the people who were targeted uh, by replication attempts um, quickly um, quickly brought up uh, this concept of bullying. And by some of the way these replication advocates acted, they were tr apparently trying to prove that right. They were crowing and said, ah, gotcha. Another one bites the dust. I failed to replicate this study. So I've unmasked another fraud. And you see how quickly people put on that superhero cape. Uh, you know, they put on their little Batman mask of, uh, of you know, I've uncovered a serious scientific fraud here. Uh, it's what keeps a lot of people going, to be honest, in the face of a lot of absence of incentives to do this kind of checking work. Um, but you see very quickly there's there's posturing about strength of power. My replication is valid. Your original finding is not valid. No, my original finding is valid. Your replication has failed to consider uh, this thing and all things. So, um, and so actually, in one, un, un, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Simona Schnall is now at Cambridge got caught up in one of these uh, debates and she she had uh, one of her studies uh, non-replicated uh, by Brent Donald Donnellan and uh, he went out and tweeted in this kind of you know triumphal triumphalist tone and um, eventually things just and I'm not I'm not going to try to you know cast aspersions on anyone here for their behavior I'm just going to point out that this very quickly became moralized to the point that they were drawing comparisons to the American civil rights movement and you know one of its heroes, Rosa Parks. And now at the same time that you have this competing uh, trying to grab onto uh, trying to grab onto uh, you know the moral high ground, at the same time there's a very fascinating process that goes on that is in the spirit of my man here, uh, not at his full growth of mustache just yet, Friedrich Nietzsche I'm referring to, uh, the sort of anti-moralist philosopher who said that morality is actually just a tool for the weak to tear down the strong. And so often you'll see rhetoric against a moralized position that is very Nietzschean in that it uses derogation of moral motives of, or, or character. And again, without, without trying to trace these, each of these points of aspersion to its origin. Um, I've seen all of these brought up in the discourse where they're saying you're not so moral after all. It's not that I'm a moral hero, it's that you don't have a moral leg to stand on. Your feet are made of clay. 
And so you see um, that the, the only way to undermine a moral or a moralized claim is to say you're not really moral because you're acting somehow in your own self-interest. So accusations of power motives, you know, you're the replication police, you know, wearing your sheriff's badge and riding into town. Some, some have been compared to data Nazis, uh, you know, the go-to comparison, uh, Godwin's law, right? Uh, everything degenerates into a Nazi analogy. Second stringers, you're just envious of these more prestigious researchers, and I've never heard of you, but you're doing a replication of my study, and you're trying to tear me down out of envy, not out of love for science, but sheer envy. Just demoniac motives. You want to destroy, rip and destroy. You you know, you're just, you're, you're like a, a mindless toddler who just wants to rampage through and destroy everything. And finally, sometimes these this rhetoric alludes to fashion or comporty moments. Oh, you are, you're just the cool kids in the SIPs crowd. You're part of the replication fad. You know, this is all blow over. You'll see. We lived through this before, the 1970s. Yeah. So, um, I think I've, I've made clear that uh, it's not really productive either to moralize on the level of a of, of a practice or on the level of a um, of a, a, a of an in group of an identity. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to now flip and talk about try to analyze a principle that has been under moralized, something that people have been very slow to realize, which is the which is the idea. So I'm again, this is not necessarily to pick on Roy Baumeister, but uh, this is a this is a quote. Uh, the personal email communication is with uh, Uli Shimak, uh, and uh, Roy Baumeister just um, has whatever you can say about him. He's been very honest, and in being honest, he's sometimes been right, and so, uh, at at least. Uh, exposed and been and been straightforward about some of the practices that led to this reproducibility crisis. So he said, we did run multiple studies, some of which did not work and some which worked better than others. You may think that not reporting the less successful studies is wrong, but that is how the field works. So this is the this is basically what he's doing is he's he's emphasizing pragmatism over morality. And he's just saying, you know, that's just how we do business around here. And you moralizers are on the wrong foot because, you know, if if you were to in, in, impose your standards, um, yeah, there would be no field to do. So what I'm going to focus on is this is this idea that we have had selective reporting of, of only significant results in social psychology and, and I'm sure other fields of psychology as well. That if you have to study with a non-significant result, it got so bad that people would advise you don't include that in your article uh, because the editor will just say, you know, take this study out. We don't want to see non-significant results. And it was just seen as business as usual and it was seen maybe as not something that was the most morally heroic, but just acceptable. And as I recall back, the things that people told me about why this was acceptable. Um, I can't help but see it in terms of our own research again uh, on morality, and in particular, Bernie Leidner's research on morality shifting, the idea that you can justify something that is less than moral by saying this is actually serving a higher good, right? So, you know, in, in the gang, uh, sure, I shot that guy, but he was going to tell on the gang and my morality is loyalty to the gang. And so some of these sort of gangster type justifications in the psychology field were, and I actually heard, I, I heard the phrase very early on when some people wanted to talk to me about this, uh, you know, some very well established researchers had a chat with me about this and they said, uh, nobody wants to hear your whole intellectual odyssey when they read a paper which I think is a very interesting and ultimately, if you look at it, anti-intellectual statement. Um, but the, you know, the argument is think of the poor readers. If you had to report every study, including the non-significant ones, oh, these papers would be so long and so boring. And then you pivot to the field would become unfun if everything were reported. It's fun when you see studies that worked and it's not fun if you see studies that didn't work, right? Imagine taking this approach to a tax auditor, you know, you you don't want to hear about all my boring bank accounts in the Cayman Islands. Just I'm just going to report the the fun income from my little cupcake shop, and you know that. Anyway, um, 
I guess you might ask it at this point, why isn't reporting all studies? Why hasn't it been? I mean, some of you see it as an ethical issue now, but um, it's very difficult. And I, I tried to do this in, in the journal JESB. I tried to talk with my editors and see, is there some sort of form of words that we can make people put in just to say that, um, you know, we have reported all relevant studies uh, about this, uh, the topic of this article. In other words, saying our hands are clean, we have no file drawer. Um, this was difficult, and we we had to put we had to put that idea to rest because of pragmatic concerns. There might be good reasons to hire to to not report studies if they failed, you know, a manipulation check, for example. There might be, and there's also very fuzzy questions about how do you define a line of research? If you're running five or six related studies, you could package these studies up in many different ways. So how how can you say that you've reported all studies that are relevant to this when you might end up packaging them in completely different ways? And so we found, but this is the, you know, even in, in as we were trying to um, look for the moral solution. We were not looking for any given practice, but rather we were trying to see could we develop a practice that would serve this principle that um, we want to know whether the study is just one little crumb out of a vast file drawer or whether this is just actually, um, you know, th this is a, a good representation of the studies you have run. And we find, found it difficult to set a concrete standard for that. But if you if you step back a little bit from the difficulty of creating a practice and look at the principle, what a lot of people don't realize is that even in the American Psychological Association, and by the way, the BPS, the British organization, pretty much draws its ethics code from uh, the APA. It's based on the APA ethics code, and the, and the publication practices are also based on that. So if you look at the publication manual, and uh, we're right now on the seventh edition, this new and shiny uh, object uh, that makes the APA uh, quite a bit of money uh, selling it. But even in the fourth edition, I don't even know, I think this was the one, sixth was in 10, 2010, uh, fifth was in 2003. So this one was from the 90s and it looks like it too. The whole, the whole typesetting looks like 90s. Uh, but in the fourth edition and thereafter, um, the APA publication manual has said it is unethical to omit troublesome observations from reports to present a more convincing story, right? And you just think of all these people who've had APA journal editors saying, we don't want to see that, um, we don't want to see that uh, study because it's not a significant result, okay? And uh, obviously, not everyone is reading deeply into the publication manual. And so once the reform movement got got rolling, they realized this is, you know, this selective reporting is actually a problem. Um, and sometimes you can tell that you have a lot of results that are just barely at significance, and it's quite unlikely that you would have gotten a P.04, a P.03, a P.045, and so on, just by mere chance. It looks, but that's the kind of pattern you get when you skim the cream off a, off a very large file drawer and just and just go for the significant ones. And so um, Mickey Inslicht, uh, an editor at JP General, asked, uh, in the spirit of this reform, asked the authors for a revision clearing out the file drawer and thanks to meta -an -anal analysis and aggregation. Um, although, yeah, if you have to go through all these uh, 18 studies, it might be a very boring slog. There's a way to present them that is easy to grasp and not at all an intellectual odyssey. And that should, gives you with much more confidence a result that is at the same time less spectacular than the effect sizes from reporting just the significant reports. The data are not always pretty, says Inslicht. They have warts, but they are real. Um, and I think one of the, and I'm gonna close out here pretty soon so you all can start asking questions, but I think some of the moral issues in these practices that that support robust findings more generally than just complete disclosure um, is that this is a real moral issue because you need to row upstream against the tendency of scientists to promote their own stuff. 
Individuals benefit from exaggerating claims. Individuals benefit from productivity under inertia. It's not that there are these good guys and bad guys, but there are these moral questions that everyone is, is subject to. So we're all anti-heroes. We're all, you know, Tony Sopranos, Walter Whites, uh, you know, and so on, right? We, we, um, we all are tempted by these incentives. Individuals benefit from exaggerating claims, from being more productive by cutting corners and skipping steps. And then when, when you compare this kind of science, which seems to come up with these amazing counterintuitive results, as opposed to science that is based on solid theory, solid results, boring, checking everything, you know, again, this, this, this claim, this false moralized claim that these you know, these tentative claims are boring, I, I think is just, if you look at it, this is a claim maybe if we were entertainers that I would accept, if we were comedians or jugglers, then I'd say, yeah, this act is kind of boring, but we shouldn't be seen as people who put on an act. We should be seen as people who find the truth and communicate it to the public. So society and science as a whole benefit from accurate claims. So this is just a question. The moral question here is not who's the good guys, who's the bad guys, but how can we get people to see it as in their interest to go ahead and use these robust practices. Um, I'd really like to get to this. I can see, I said I was going to go 45 minutes and here we are at 45 minutes, but we started a little late, right? So I'm just going to get you one, five more minutes to do this. this. This kind of thinking about not whether the practices are good or bad, but whether the principles are good or bad can also help us deal with cases where things that are conceived in the spirit of open science and on the side of the angels have an unintended consequence. If you're going to say that all the all the articles submitted to my journal must have a power of 80% at least to detect a, a small effect size, or they must have an N of at least 200, then what this means is that people, you can no longer study populations or use methods that are difficult to enact in mass. And this is a frequently brought up objection and if you just take the identity point of view, for example, they say, oh, those are just the stick in the muds. That's this is just noise from the, you know, from the from the people who we, we shouldn't be listening to. But, you know, you have to treat it seriously if you realize that, yeah, the, another important principle is that our science is representative, that we don't become this science of, you know, Western, white, affluent, uh, you know, university students. Uh, or whatever, and if you're if you're trying to get uh, do research in hard to reach populations, or you're using methods that are also hard to enact in mass uh, in, in the lab, then you might see these requirements of this moralization of practice as a as a threat to goals you do consider as moral, which is the ability of of people to do research and the ability of certain topics and and populations to be studied. Um, and I think I think the answer to that is you need attention to both. There is already resource inequality. Even in the year 1980 or so, you in the United States where I, I did my you know my training, uh, I was in, I was in junior high school in 1980. So I'm just you taking a, a very long view here. But um, back in 1980, you still had Ohio State University with a 2000 person introductory psychology class from which they could draw endless numbers of participants. If you're doing research at a place like, I don't know, Swarthmore College, another place where I, I taught in the past, uh, where you really have to beg the students and you have maybe like, you know, 30 psych students at any one time, then you can't do the kind of research that you could do at Ohio State. This already exists. So we're just raising the tide, but some boats are floating higher than others. Um, social justice is orthogonal to robustness, right? Uh, on one hand, it means that, um, you know, the facts of statistics uh, don't in a way care about social justice, but but also it means that if you value social justice, you need to find a way to square it with robustness concerns without entirely throwing them out the window. But that also means that robustness concerns have to keep an eye on whether you are creating an unrepresentative science by this. Some solutions will require changing the way we, we give 
credit in psychology. They require honoring collective contributions rather than this view of the heroic individual. Again, this may be a narrative of competence rather than morality uh, that needs to be questioned, this idea of the, of the one PI who does it all, um, which is, again, throughout history has led to a lot of injustices, a lot of people's contributions being papered over. Um, and in fact, uh, some requirements for robustness, the idea that your samples should not be just this very constrained group of people, but in order to generalize should, should be more broadly tested, this actually opens doors to less well-represented regions. And, and in the best practices of these, it, it leads to invitations to, to people in other areas of the world than the, than the usual areas that, that fill our journals to take part in research. And hopefully we can do this in a democratic and not an exploitative way uh, by involving them in the research, not just using them as a resource. Um, and if we look at the APA 7th edition, unfortunately, I have no access to my flatbed scanner. This is a terrible photo I took with my phone of, of the APA. I, I doubt holding this up to the screen would be any better. But um, in APA 7th editions, we are now being much more specific and saying represented uh, data generated hypotheses post hoc as if they were pre-planned is a violation of basic ethical principles and also selectively failing to report studies that had just because they had results that don't support the preferred narrative. So I, I well, my cursor is showing. So this paragraph also is much more specific in the new APA. Will the editors enforce this? Will they enforce the JARS standards in the new APA 7th edition? I don't have time to get into all of that. So let's just go to the brief conclusion here. Uh, morality, I think, does not inhere in the practices that we use because even practices conceived in the spirit of goodness can be can be turned around and used uh, for for purposes that go against uh, moral science. Morality doesn't inhere in identities. I don't want to see this reduced to who's in what clubhouse. I want I want us to focus on open science, doing open science rather than being open science. But instead, I think that morality inheres in principles such as, you know, is this going to benefit science or just individual careers? Is this going to benefit, is this going to give us an accurate view of human psychology or is it only going to focus on a few uh, highly selected participant populations? So uh, with that, I will stop talking and take some of these questions that have come up in the Q&A. So how do you want, uh, thank you, thank you. So how, how do you how do you want me to go about this here, uh, Sam? So, so, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so what I can do is, um, I can just feed you the questions. And uh, so we already have one already. Uh, we have a um, question for There's Harry. There's a Q&A button if I just click yeah, on yeah. this. Yeah, so, oh, here we go, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, someone called Stuart. And uh, whoops, yeah, yeah. and now it's disappeared. Yeah. No, no, it's no, been I've published. Published. yeah, I published it now. It's been Jeez. published, okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a filter. Yeah. Oh, I, was seeing, I was seeing the raw stuff. I was seeing all the hateful invective. And, okay, <laughs> I think Harriet in that case um, came with the first question here. What's my opinion on the moral outcry about Diederich Stoppel? Well, obviously he is one of the fail moral failure cases. Um, you know, he's the, he, I think even though I think the BEM, the Daryl BEM paper was more uh, influential in what it inspired, because a lot of the, a lot of the reforms we've taken on cannot help us identify that kind of out and out fraud. They can help us control researchers who are too enthusiastic, jump to conclusions, kind of use questionable research practices to massage data that they actually really collected. When you just go out and, you know, fill in questionnaires yourself or fill in data sets yourself with no study having been conducted, yeah, that's a very obvious kind of fraud. In a way, in a way he's become this kind of uh, target of Godwin's laws. I referred to the tendency for all uh, all metaphors in a moralized discussion to degenerate into Hitler and the Nazis, uh, right? So it's like, oh, this is, you know, you're just like Diederich Stoppel, right? Um, so I think, you know, it goes without saying that what he did was wrong, profoundly wrong, 
And the contrast between that and the success that he achieved in the field of social cognition was really shocking to a lot of people. And it was hard to say this is just a minor figure. There were a couple of other people who were involved in fraud cases in the, you know, the 10 or so years prior to this. But he, that big name and the audacity of the fraud was something that nobody could uh, ignore. Now, having said that, so I think the moral outcry was justified, obviously. But having said that, and having also kept an eye on some of these other cases that have been looked at and investigated since then, I think after he was found out, Stoppel behaved as in an as exemplary a manner as you could do so once having done this. That is, it is like the serial killer who cooperates with the police when he's rumbled and shows them where all the bodies are buried so that the families can at least have peace of mind. Okay? In that, he cooperated with investigators and described exactly which of his data sets uh, were fraudulent and which ones were legitimate. And this is very important because he, he worked with a lot of uh, PhD students, and some of them did do honest work and collect their own data. And it's very important to identify that so they can go on and have a career, even facing a considerable headwind of having been associated with this character in the first place. And I know, you know, at least two people who are now doing pretty well in, the, in their careers who wouldn't, who would have just been snowed under if Stoppel hadn't cooperated that way. And I know, conversely, a number of other people who have been accused and obviously have very fishy data out there who have not fessed up in that way. Um, and, and that is causing problems, of course, for people who work with them. Um, so I will say, say what you will, <laughs> say what you will uh, about Diedrich Stoppel. He at least had a, had an ethos. <laughs> Once he was caught, he, he realized, uh, you know, it's time to cooperate. So I don't know, that's a very short question from Harriet. So I, I, I don't know if I answered that, but that, that's just what comes to mind. On to, on to this uh, Stuart uh, question. That's Stuart Ritchie. Oh, good old Stuart Ritchie. Hello, Stuart. Um, do you think the moral aspects you've discussed apply more strongly to psychology than to other sciences? Psychology is often more relevant to moral concerns. Uh, that's right. I'm, I'm very aware of the kind of meta of this talk uh, that I'm using, you know, concepts like moral disgust, moral contagion um, to, uh, to, to discuss this meta science than other subjects, e.g. theoretical um, physics. Maybe due to the coronavirus, we'd see something similar happening with virology, epidemiology, etc. Right? As, as Neil Ferguson has has found out uh, to his dismay, um, you know, you come under exceptional moral scrutiny when you set yourself up with this moralized, uh, you know, discourse. Which you know, I, I think it's legitimate to say it's a moral issue to maintain public health. Um, I want to give. Uh, a shout out to uh, to a, a researcher working in uh, in in Britain right now. Actually, I think uh, Michael. I think he's working in Britain. Michael Debara. I examined his his PhD thesis a long time ago. He's he 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 got his PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and studied hygiene practices in Bangladesh. Worked with uh, Val Curtis, uh, who's who's a really you know very influential discussed researcher in her own right. And, um, you know, and, and he, he, his whole point, one of the points from that thesis is that hygiene is a moral issue. That in a situation such as he studied in Bangladesh, where cholera is being spreaded, spread through human feces, then just going out and defecating in a field is not only a disgusting practice, but a moral issue because you are endangering other folks. Um, so, so yeah, I totally see now that the, this moralization questioning is coming up in, in epidemiology. Is it, is it, is it moral to have all these people die? Is it moral to, you know, take advice that would give a, a very profound hit to the economy? These, 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 these points of views are definitely moralized and, you know, someone with a little bit more eye to the actual field could probably give a very similar talk about how discourse in these fields, and because now everyone's an epidemiologist, right? Everyone, everyone is an amateur epidemiologist and would like to think they know exactly what's going on. Uh, and I think a lot of that is moralization. 
Um, but yeah, the moral apps. No, I. I don't think psychology is unique. In. Uh, I think any other field that is that is facing a crisis that has to do with the promotion of individuals over the promotion of long term knowledge in the science. Uh, like, for example, you know, candidate gene studies, which, as I understand, I understand very little of this field. So probably there are some geneticists out there who could correct me. But as I understand it, there have been a lot of papers published in this field that were based ex essentially upon uh, fishing for results with an inadequate sample size and and pointing out with a sel with selective reporting uh, things that appear to be significant when you do it with a better sample size and, and more error control. A lot of these uh, effects just just evanesce. And uh, yeah, I, you might expect that a similar kind of rhetoric might it'd be interesting to look in and see if it has might show up. And yeah, but maybe there is something to that. I don't know. I'm, 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 this is a very deep and hard question for me to ask, especially because I'm so ignorant of what goes on in other sciences and whether they moralize their own methodological and epistemic uh, issues to the extent that we do. So I'm going to have to take a pass on that, but maybe some other people who know uh, have more of a feeling for what's going on elsewhere could weigh in. OK, I think we have one in the queue. Uh, no, Sam? I know. That was just a, a thank you for, uh, okay. for a fantastic talk. Um, I I guess I it's one o'clock now, but if I could just pinch a few minutes of your of your time, yeah, I, we can I go just, a little bit over. Just to just to say that I think if a couple of points that you made were really really important, and and I think you know there is this fear that certain people will be left behind with uh, the you know the the inequity in the distribution of resources is an absolutely valid point. And certain people are trapped, for want of a better word, in in research teams that operate in a certain way. So it would be it would be unwrong. It would be wrong and unnecessary to sort of tar people with the same brush, even though that they're maybe junior members of the team and they really don't have much say in, in the direction of their work. Well, that was just an observation. I do have one question, which is um, I think one of the things with with the language around uh, this, this, uh, how things are moralized and 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 uh, and demonized. It, uh, the word sort of ethical and moral are quite. Uh, they do have quite a potency and a, a, and power to to make people uh, be uh, to stand up to attention. And and when you see these words, you you really do listen in and and see what is the right thing to do. Yeah, but the, the the continual reapplication of these words in certain contexts, such as around p-values, I wonder whether their their meaning does diminish over time. And you know, if everything is a moral uh, issue, nothing is a moral issue in a way. And so my concern is the long-term negative uh, prospect for the for words such as ethics and moral because they do lose their meaning over time with with repeated use. So I wondered if you had any comment or thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it is getting kind of tired to um, call people Nazis and the actual Nazis are actually quite happy about that, right? You know, <laughs> you're just calling me a Nazi. Oh, typical, typical rubbish. Uh, yeah, that's that's a thing that's happening. This this moral fatigue ultimately weakens our uh, moral immune system for real. So I think you have to treat it as a you have to treat it like like penicillin, like antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Don't treat every common cold with the antibiotics, so they won't be, they won't be there for you when you need them. Um, you know, think really carefully if you're going to bring up the civil rights movement. You know, just um, uh, so I, I think I think that is true. Now, now morals and morality and ethics, uh, I think it's in, it's interesting to separate the two because mor morality provides the principles and this kind of reasoning as well as the moralization. We don't see, we don't say ethicalization, do we? And I think that points to a difference that ethics are more concrete. Ethics are more anchored to what do you actually do? What are the practices that you follow? What are the standards of your, uh, of your field of inquiry? And um, so 
I don't think people will get tired of ethics. You might get tired of the bureaucracy surrounding ethics. And as I've said, if you if you think that morality inheres in practice, that means that they're see this is explaining all sorts of things that bug me that I didn't know could explain. I'm just realizing this right now that when I was in America when you know and working and doing research there, it was during a time when ethical procedures were, were becoming really onerous in a very liability and litigious based society. Um, and all ethical approvals had to be done by committees, including lay members. They took over a month to get back to you. They would have ridiculous layperson type questions that, um, you know, I think there are good layperson type questions like, you know, what's the value of this research? But they, they just had questions that were based on complete misconceptions of what we were doing. So, you know, all this onerous, I think is is a hyper ethicalization. You can put that side by side with hyper moralization when you when you say, you know, this innocuous research where you're looking at the Stroop effect and your only ethical concern is that you're boring participants. Does it really have to go through the same kind of strictures as when you're you know giving them electrical shocks or you know suppressing their brain functions temporarily? or whatever. Um, I don't know. Different places have different answers. We have a quite laissez-faire regime as far as I know, most places in the UK and back in the US it's another story. Um, similar to the university travel agency. Remember traveling? Yeah, that was a thing. And when I would go to a conference, they would always ask these questions that were obviously uh, put there by their insurance company. Like, are you, you know, are you intending, uh, does this place you're visiting have rabid animals. Um, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to New York. Uh, rabies has not been eradicated there. Uh, are you planning to pilot a fixed wing or rotary wing aircraft? No, I hope not. I hope we're not in an airplane movie situation where I'm the only one who's able to pilot the plane because based on my, my uh, performance in flight simulator games back in the day, we would all crash. But, you know, th these things... Um, you, you can have hyper ethicalization as well, but it, it manifests more as bureaucratic crud uh, than actually something actively noxious and toxic. So I don't know, I think I, I got off on a tangent there, but I hope that goes some way to answering your question, Sam. No, 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 no. thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, I think uh, we'll draw this to a close. Before before I do uh, end the, the stream, I just wanted to say it was a really fantastic talk and I've been receiving comments and uh, emails just to say that it was a really, uh, really wonderful talk. Very different from what we're, what we're used to. It's really nice to have a, a discussion, a sort of a meta-meta discussion, I guess. Um, <laughs> I keep going and going, but- Yeah, uh, but look out for the meta-meta-meta. Yeah. You know, that's the next level of someone's gonna <laughs> know, dunk on that, people. That is really wired. Um, so yes, but thank you so much, Roger, for your time and and uh, and co committing to this uh, talk. And uh, yes, I I wish you all all the best and uh, stay healthy and stay safe. All uh, right, you all, everyone, everyone as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye, Sam. Bye. Bye.